Jesse, welcome to the show. Thank you. And how excited to be here. Thank you for the invitation. There with your company with Sweater Ventures, uh, very excited to talk about all different things around this, as we mentioned before chatting here, so many different models out there that we're trying to open up access to the asset class that is uh, venture capital and investing in the startups and very intrigued by what you're doing at Sweater Ventures. But for the people who don't really know what Sweater Ventures is, uh, what are you doing with Sweater Ventures, Jesse? Yeah, well, Sweater is a VC fund that anyone can invest into. So most people don't realize it, but venture capital basically powers the whole startup economy. And the only people that can participate in the finance side of venture capital are folks that can write quarter million or half million dollar checks on the very low end to actually participate with any type of VC fund that is providing the financing for startups to grow up and, and become big like Airbnb or Uber or you know, whoever else you want to think of. Uh, and so we're taking that half a million dollar minimum and taking it down to $500. So anybody can download our app and, you know, we have a lot of content. We do a lot of storytelling in there to give people a feeling like they have courtside seats to the whole process of actually building companies. And of course, as part of that, it's not just the entertainment. You also have a financial stake in the companies that are being built. So in a nutshell, that's really what we're building. I want to unpack all of those pieces, Jesse, but first, but first, <laughs> This company, why why start this in the first place? Everyone's going to want to know, like, how does this even come about? Tell us about the origin story. Yeah, so I've been working professionally in venture for about a decade. Uh, I worked for a startup accelerator that ended up raising a venture fund. And uh, it was a great experience there. I ended up leading, up leading operations, and I built an accelerator program from the ground up. Um, but they kind of hamstrung themselves in the way they built their venture fund um, and kind of tied their shoelaces together, so to speak. And when they came out of the <laughs> yeah. gates, they just you know, it, it's kind of ended up being like a bad angel network in a way. And, um, you know, I love those guys, but it just didn't work out. And years later, that particular region I was in still didn't have any good venture capital. And I was like, why am I waiting for someone else to do this? I could, I could build a VC fund. So I started going into this process and was immediately made aware that I would not be able to invest in my own fund because I was not an accredited investor. And I thought that was kind of absurd. I'm like, I'm the guy running the fund. Like, I mean, I knew about accreditation requirements. I'd been around when they raised this other fund, but I, uh, I, I was kind of perplexed and now I had a reason to be interested. And so uh, part of my graduate work was in policy. And so I decided I wanted to dive in and understand where accreditation requirements came from. And um, I didn't like the answer I found, really, at the end of the day. <laughs> I, the, the justification for accreditation laws roots back to these two laws, the 1933 Securities Act, 1940, Investment Company Act that were born out of the Great Depression and, and were made to protect widows and orphans, as they say, right? Um, but the justification for it really wasn't well founded. And it, it basically says if you're not wealthy, then you're probably not smart enough to understand this really complicated stuff and, and we need to protect you. And it, it just, to me, it came off as so condescending because I was like, look, if I fall into that category and all these smart people that I know they're unaccredited fall into that category, then this is archaic. And it really lit a fire under me to want to do something different um, and, and to figure out how to crack the code. So that was the beginning of the journey. And there was a lot that came after that, but it took about four <laughs> years to get where we are now. So that is exactly what I want to get into. Okay. The four years of going from idea to uh, dealing with SEC regulation, uh, going through all of those, those things, just take me through what that even entailed those four years. I heard that in a different podcast episode and he kind of glossed over it. And I was like, wait, 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 back up four years. Like people always think about like, starting things and like, oh yeah, attraction like a month or two or three months, but like four years, what were you doing in four years? Oh my gosh. Yeah. Well, I'll, I'll give you the reader's digest version, <laughs> hopefully a little bit more detail than what you heard before. Um, and if you want more detail, I'm happy to give it to you. I'm curious. It, so yeah. it was uh, it was a long path. I mean, first of all, there, there's no, there's no map in the SEC, right? Well, let's back up even before the SEC. So at the beginning, you know, we were like, oh, there's gotta be some way to do this. And we started kind of going down the usual rabbit holes, which is basically looking at VC funds as a legal structure and saying, there's gotta be a loophole. And we're poking around and saying, there's gotta be some way to like, you know, eke some people in. And there's just not, you know, I mean, nothing meaningful. And uh, you don't wanna build a business on a loophole anyway, it's a bad idea. Uh, and so we are like, okay, that's not gonna work. We can't use the traditional structure in any way. So let's look at uh, regulation crowdfunding, Reg CF and Reg A plus, which are kind of cousins to each other in that space. And we dug in on those and there's actually very specific language that basically says you cannot use this structure for aggregating investment dollars. 
yeah. uh, to, to make investments in other companies. It has to be, they're only used to make an investment in a specific company, not into a fund. And it's super clear. It's like, okay, there's no getting around that. And there's others in the space that have tried to like let you buy into the GP and, and you know, Arlen Hamilton and, and others that's that have done some really interesting yeah. things. But uh, it, let's just say it wasn't designed for that. And, and, and there's a lot of conversation in the SEC about that approach. And I don't know that that's going to be a loophole that could be used any longer, but it's still not the same as investing into a fund. It's, it's fundamentally different. Yeah. And so we were like, okay, that's not going to work. And that's where most people stop, right? They looked at that and said, well, there's, there's nothing else to be done. And let's just go build a traditional VC fund because that's just easier. Um, but we ended up having, and we were about ready to throw in the towel, but we ended up having a meeting with um, a really interesting attorney who was not in the VC space. He was from the broader private equity space. And he's the one that really brought us back and said, look, you got to zoom up another 30,000 feet here, 100,000 feet, and look at this whole financial ecosystem. And he's the one that taught us about the 1933 Securities Act, 1940 Investment Company Act. And he's like, look, you have to think about those as like this giant umbrella. And over the course of time, what happened was people or you know institutions would come to the SEC and say, hey, we want to do a very specific thing. Give us some exemptions. Let us structure it like this. And they would go back and forth to the SEC and create this thing. And then after that, that thing became like a product and it was on the shelf. And anybody could walk into the SEC and say, hey, I want to do that too. And they could take it off the shelf and then go implement it. Um, so like REITs, uh, ETFs, uh, hedge funds, you know, you name it, like all these financial instruments you hear about were created by someone from scratch at some point, and then everyone else had access. And so he opened our minds. He's like, look, venture capital is one of those prepackaged things, but you've got to understand that there are dozens of these fund structures that live underneath this umbrella. And he's like, I, he said, I've got feeling that one of those already existing fund structures would work. And so our question became, is there a fund structure that would that exists that would allow us to basically pool money from non-accredited investors and invest into the same asset class as venture capital in private companies, but not actually be the venture capital product that came off the shelf? And that became the key question. And we started pursuing that. So this was, you know, at this point, we're about six months in when we almost threw in the towel. And then we had this question and we're like, OK, we got a breadcrumb trail and we started pursuing this. And so we talked to attorneys and like this guy didn't know. And he, he had some people to talk to. And we talked to other people and every this was basically the answer we got. People were like, oh, that sounds interesting. And, you know, like like maybe there's a little bit of something there. You should talk to someone at the SEC. And they're like, look, the building's over there. And we're like, well, no kidding. Like we, we know where the <laughs> building's at. But like, who do we talk to? And they're like, well, I don't know. <laughs> and so we kept getting this answer over and over again. And over the course of about a year, we just kept e ending up with empty hands. Until we met this one guy. So, and th this is like where the power of a network comes in. My co-founder was connected to this. Um, I think he's a billionaire, maybe like on the verge. He's probably not a billionaire anymore, <laughs> given the market downturns. Sure. But, you know, kind of like on that, on the verge of, of things there, right? And we talked to this guy and he's like, you know what? I have a friend that used to be at the SEC and he just left and became a partner at this, at this law firm. You should talk to him. And we talked to this guy and he's like, oh yeah, I think that sounds really interesting. And you should talk to someone at the SEC. And here's a map of the building and here's where all the rooms are, all the offices, and here's who's in every office. And you should get these seven people on the phone. And, and I know them all. Should I give them a call? And we were like, <laughs> are you kidding me? Like, yes, absolutely. And crazy as it was, like he knew everybody, but it still took six months to actually get that meeting organized. Yeah. And, um, you know, and we found out about all this programming they have inside the SEC that, that's not published anywhere. Nobody knows about it. Uh, there was this thing called the FinTech Working Group that was basically like people inside the SEC could volunteer to work with young companies with innovative ideas to provide feedback and stuff free of charge. And so he organized one of these for us, which was just like a miracle. And when we showed up to that meeting, um, we had our thesis of how we you know, wanted to go about it, like, like how, what we thought they cared about. And it was really funny because we walked into the meeting and they're like, hey, you know, we've actually been talking about this for years. And uh, we've been waiting for someone to come to us and ask us about it. And here's the three fund options we think would actually work well. Uh, would any of those work for the business model you're thinking about? And we're like, what? Are you kidding? I was like, hand it to us on a silver platter. <laughs> and so we, we went back and researched these fund structures and the pros and cons and the, and the operating dynamics. And, and they're all, they were all very different from the way a traditional VC fund operates from a legal perspective. And we came back with one of them. We said, we can make this one work. And they said, okay. When you're ready, come back. You have to go through a full registration process and 
we knew it would take nine to 12 months and cost at least a half a million dollars. And so from that point, that was about almost three years in, was two and a half years in when we had that conversation with the SEC. And then we raised a little bit of pre-seed money. Uh, and for the record, Sweater is a fintech company first, right? So yeah. we raised money for the fintech company. Um, and then we used that money to go through the SEC process, which ended up taking 11 months and cost over a half a million dollars. Um, we built out a wait list of 70,000 people. We, we recruited 150 scouts across the country. We got handshakes with about 30 VCs across the country to uh, do co-investments with. Uh, and we built out the technology. And it was about, it's been about two and a half months ago now, the SEC, we, we finalized that process and the SEC declared our fund effective is the nice way of saying it has been approved. And uh, then we were off to the races. So okay, that uh, wasn't very Reader's Digesty, but no, that was that perfect. Was that was perfect. That's exactly what I wanted. There were some missing pieces there that I was curious about from a timing perspective, because anything super new and innovative that people aren't doing before to gloss over the details of how it happened to me is like a travesty. I'm like, wait, what? Like, I want to know how this came to be. So I appreciate you sharing that. And there's a couple of things in there that I'm curious about. So with the fundraising, as you mentioned, you're a fintech, you raise venture capital. At what point did you decide that you needed to? Is it right when you know like, oh, this is going to cost like a half a million dollars? Was it earlier than that? Like, were you bootstrapping initially? Just take me through some of the like, logistics behind that. Uh, I'm curious because it is interesting because you have this fintech, but also investing in the companies. So like, it's it's interesting. <laughs> yeah, there's a little bit of inception there, yeah. uh, for sure. Um, yeah, so you know, just from a how we did it perspective. So the first three years, we didn't take a check. There was no revenue earned. There was no money raised. Everything was coming out of our own pockets. Just you know, going along with this very slow and drawn out process. So yeah. I mean, on a personal level, I had a, a marketing business that I was running. My co-founder uh, at the time also had his own things. He had a different startup that he had been involved in. That he was still an advisor on. He had projects he worked in. He's an angel investor. Um, and so between us, you know, we were just kind of doing our own thing and then putting in, you know, 15, 20 hours a week on sweater, trying to continue to advance this very slow process. Um, and so I didn't take a check until basically right on the three year mark, we raised our, our first, uh, nice. you know, real aggregation of angel money in that pre-seed round. Um, so yeah, I mean, it was, it was a grind, but I mean, that this, this is a lesson I actually learned that I, I think is super valuable from a different startup I had about seven or eight years ago that ended up not working out. And the biggest mistake that I, I made then was that I was only focused on raising money. I wasn't focused on surviving financially yeah. on a personal level. And until you've raised money and even after you raise money stuff to survive financially, but I made a mistake and I was just living off savings that was slowly going down and down and down. And pretty soon I was at a point where I, I couldn't hang on anymore and I had to leave. And so I learned that I had to go get an emergency job so that I could feed my kids. And that was a terrible experience for me. It put me in a really bad financial bind. Um, but I came out of that knowing that if I was going to do that again, I had to know how to survive on my own. And so I actually, that's why I had this marketing business and that's what was paying the bills. And the only reason that I was able to hang on as long as was required to get to this point. Yeah, so that's, I mean, it's good to know that, that context for that. So three years in, then, then you raise, then you raise money in that, in that raise though, take me through then with that convincing people of this new idea, innovative idea, different model. You're like, we had to go through the sec to make this happen. It's going to cost a lot of money to do this. Like just take me through that pitch and getting investors on board for this kind of crazy idea that you wanted to do. Well, I don't think we had it any easier or harder than, than any other founder. I mean, in, in a way, like the only thing we had to talk about that was evidence that this was possible was that we had gotten, we, we called it the green light. So we, we got the green light from the SEC, which is basically the invitation to come back and go through the registration, hmm, yeah. excuse me, the registration process, right? Which we knew was going to take nine to 12 months and cost half a million dollars. But th there was no guarantee coming out the other side that everything would work out, yeah. right? In the middle of that, we changed administrations, like yeah. all kinds of stuff happened. And, um, you know, you know, so the pitch was really about the vision of the future and the opportunity of what we had discovered that no one else had ever done before. And it was, you know, kind of faith promoting, so to speak, <laughs> to have these awesome people come to believe in what we were doing, even though uh, unlike, you know, most startups that can go out and build a prototype or an MVP and start, you know, eking out sales and actually showing traction, we couldn't do that. Uh, it was you know, there's literally nothing that we could do. And and from a lot of regulatory levels, we, we couldn't do things. Yeah. Um, and so when we started that, that pre-seed raise, it was really about like, it started with people that we knew and trusted and we finally approached them. We had never approached them before because we, we, we knew that our, 
that there was too much variability in the future and we didn't feel good approaching friends and family about that. Yeah. Um, but when we got this green light from the SEC, we're like, we're confident we can get through this. There's still a variable there that it might not work out, but we, we know we have something. And that gave us the confidence to go about that. And then, you know, you go through this, this whole magic trick of raising <laughs> funding, which is, you know, ups and downs and all over the place trying to herd cats who are herding cats. I mean, we, we put together, I think, five SPVs as part of that first one. Mm-hmm. Um, we had a total, I think, of uh, probably about a dozen different individuals and entities on the cap table representing about 65 or 70 investors um, that came together really pretty smoothly. Um, you know, it took us about two or three months to get the first close. And then we had a second close, uh, about two months after that. So, but yeah, I mean like the pitch itself was really, was like, look, no one, every industry has been disrupted or updated with software and community, uh, and different business models. Yeah except for venture capital. It has literally been the same <laughs> since the 1960s. Yeah, that's um, and you know, there's a lot of people, including accredited investors who, who knew, who knew that. Right. And um, you know, you kind of tap into that, that kind of gut feeling. People are like, yeah, there, there really is something, you know, inherently kind of wrong that everyone can't participate in this industry. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, you, you filter through and you find the right people that trust you and, you know, uh, then it's momentum after that. And uh, you get good people around the table. We have awesome investors. So you go from that, that period. So you're like okay, three years, then you raise roughly. And then you, get, you basically get the green light to apply for the SEC, not even like have it yet. Go through this process with the SEC for months and months and months and months. Just take me through then like coming out of that. Like what, what, what happened? Like you're like, all right, we're, we're good now. We can just go. What do we build? What is it? Like, just, I want to know like what happened then once you like, for sure, not even have the green light, you're past green light. You're like on the highway already. Like take me through that then after that. <laughs> well, on the highway, it was like we were building the highway <laughs> yeah. and driving on it at the same time, you know? So we decided when we were going to raise money that we didn't want to, I, I guess, um, you know, there's a lot of things that we were going to have to do in order to get into market. Yeah. Um, and of course the SEC was one thing. And we couldn't actually launch or, or take money from anyone until we had the SEC done. But we decided that instead of like, you know, putting blocks back to back, we decided to stack them on top of each other and do a lot of things in parallel, even though there was some inherent risk in that. Um, and so when, once we had the initial close, you know, I think we brought in like 1.6 or 1.8 million in that initial close. Um, and once we had that money in the door, we immediately started the SEC process. Um, and that was in about, I don't know, May, I guess, May of 2021. And so we started that. And then in parallel, we also started the foundations of building a wait list. Um, And so we had, we took a big swing on that, which is pretty interesting if you want to talk about how we went about doing that. Um, And then we, we decided that there was a real opportunity in building out a scout network. And that was one where it was like, man, are we ahead of our, like, are we over our skis here? Because like, we can't write any checks. Why the heck are we going to build a scout (laughs) network? But we, we started doing like, we started calling it spring training. Um, where it's like, you know, we're not actually making investments yet, but we need to prove that we can find companies and that, that companies want, would want to work with us if we had money. And we started going through this process and we just had demand out the roof to be scouts. And so we officially had, well, right as of right now, we have 150 scouts officially in the program, but we have over 1200 applications that we're sitting on that we haven't been able to process. And that's just from having an application on the website. It's not even like on the front page. It's like buried somewhere. (laughs) And we still have all these people that want to come in and participate. And we're not paying anybody. There's no compensation. You know, we we just have these amazing people that align with the mission. Um, And so we started doing that as well and got that moving. Um, And then, of course, the technology. I mean, like getting any founder will tell you that getting the first couple of employees in outside the founders is just ridiculously hard, you know, (laughs) Um, and trying to find someone that will take the leap and risk a portion of their career to build what you're building. And we just had. Um, two or three engineers right at the beginning that just totally took a leap of faith and, and started building this thing from dead scratch. We had good designs put together um, because we had a really smart designer that, uh, that we found early on that gave us some visualization, but wasn't coding. And so we basically handed off these designs and said, hey, let's build. <laughs> and so that started rolling at the same time. And, you know, all of a sudden there were a lot of plates spinning and they all had to keep spinning, you know, and we're over here just like, <laughs> spin, spin, spin. Everything's going to take a long time. And we knew that we had at least, you know, eight to 12 months that we had to run all these in parallel and every, everything, you know, we connected with the ball on every one of them. It's amazing because 
it's kind of funny because you can't just twiddle your thumbs while you're waiting for the SEC. Like, there's no way you could have just waited necessarily. I mean, like, you're like, oh, we're going to just sit here, like, wait. Like, we got we to do something. Like, it's what's, what's in your control to do? And you can obviously do all these other things in the meantime while you're kind of waiting for that one piece. And if it doesn't work out, well, you're screwed anyway. So it's like, we might as well go for it, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. yeah, exactly. I, I'm curious. Well, though. yeah, it was, ahead, it, was like, it, was like, it was like part that, right? Like, we don't just want to sit around and twiddle our thumbs and part like well you know if we miss we're gonna miss anyway yeah. but at the same time it was like but when we come out of the gates because we knew there was like you know 80 90 percent chance that was going through unless yeah. something really weird happened like we were gonna get through the other side and so part of it was just like preparation like when we come out the other side we want to run hard and fast yeah and that's exactly what we've been able to do it's been phenomenal that's no, awesome and with that too you mentioned that waiting list um tens of thousands of people on this. What were you doing to to build that? Because anyone, I've talked to a number of founders on both the Just Go Grand podcast, Vitalize podcast, some who have built some massive wait lists like that. And there's fun. it's fun hearing about these strategies that people use. And uh, I selfishly, with a marketing brain I have, I'm always just like salivating and be like, okay, how'd you do this? So take me through, what did you do to build a wait list, Jesse? <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I, I had been dreaming of building this wait list literally for years, <laughs> right? I mean, we, we officially started doing it when we were at about year three in this process. And I had made friends over the course of time that had, well, I, I, let's say this, I, if you remember, I, I mentioned that I was running a marketing agency, yeah. um, you know, and, and that was paying my bills, right? So. Um, I, I very much have a marketing and kind of sales and relationship based mindset. And so I, I knew how I wanted to go about it. I had some friends uh, in a couple of different contexts that had started building um, kind of like new age commercials, I suppose, right? That, that are like, they're, they're like the infomercial of the, uh, of the YouTube age, you know? So you're looking at like Dollar Shave Club say, or yeah. Squat, Squatty Potty mm -hmm. or Poopery mm -hmm. or like, you know, chat books. There's like all these ones that like take this very storytelling, you know, kind of punchy, fun approach to capturing your attention and also educating you and taking you down a funnel at the same time, building trust and all that stuff. And so I had a couple of friends in two different worlds that were both doing this. And I remember meeting them. I was like, man, I think we could use that for sweater. Like there's just something about this story that would like resonate with people. And so when we knew the money was coming in, we started digging in with one of them. And um, we're like, okay, this is a pretty big swing. Cause like creating those commercials, I mean, it, it's a it's a production, yeah. right? I mean, like this isn't some $10,000 commercial you're gonna do. I mean, these things, six figures plus. And you know, we, <laughs> so we had, you know, we raised in the low seven figures yeah. and we're like, okay, what, well, you know, we had this conversation, <laughs> what percentage of the money we just raised are we gonna put into this asset? Yeah. And we, we had this theory that we're like, okay, like this is inherently kind of complicated in how you describe this whole situation. Yeah. And, you know, it, it was complicated talking to angel investors and people that were, you know, familiar with the space. And it, you know, we, we found that like, it was difficult to pitch sweater in five minutes with someone. It was hard to get all the context out there, but if I could spend an hour with someone, yeah. I'd get them every time. Right. And so we were like, well, now how are we going to do this with consumers who may not even have the, the, you know, I guess awareness, yeah that they can't even invest in venture. They may not even know what venture capital is. And so we're like, okay, we gotta like, if, if we're gonna advertise, we have to be able to like have something really solid. And so I, I came to this conviction that like, we had to tell a story in under 90 seconds that would capture people's imagination and attention and also educate them and get them to take an action all in 90 seconds. And I was like, I can't do that with written advertising and traditional small time stuff. We need to do a really good job of it. And so I was like, if we're gonna do this at all, we are going to swing really hard. We're going to the big leagues. And so we worked this group, uh, they're called creatively, um, out of, uh, Utah. And we went to this, uh, I'm probably giving you way too many. Oh, I love here. this. I but, love um, this. By the way. Keep going. <laughs> this is interesting. So, so, so me and my two co-founders, this was like right at the beginning. I don't think we even had any other team members when we went out for this ideation session, but we go out there, we spend a whole day with these guys. We go through all these exercises to outline the brand and the voice and the story and what we stand for and like all this other stuff. And then they went out and they came back with um, three different storylines that we could go <laughs> after. And they pitched these to us, right? And so they actually have people like playing all the roles and they're pitching it around the table. And I still remember the one that we ended up picking. Um, well, so there were three. And like one, it was kind of like, you know, uh, like mild, medium, and hot, you know, kind of from a punchiness and risk yeah, kind of perspective. Yeah. And we came out the other side, like we're like talking about it, like, okay, how. Like, how much do we want to poke the bear? 
you know, like how, how much do we want to try to grab people's attention? And cause like we could have gone real mild and just told a good story and it would have been nice, you know, and, and, you know, if people watched it, they would understand what's going on, you know, but I remember sitting there thinking, but like, we're, we're not going to, it's not like noteworthy. Yeah. Like we need to like give people a reason to say, Hey, this, this is shareable. And the first two were good, but they weren't really shareable. You know, it, there wasn't enough punch, but the third one, I mean, we were like, we were poking the bear. Like we were making fun of venture capital yeah. about rich people making like rich people making money and like making more money and throwing money in the air and like, like money on fire. And we had monkeys and like all this stuff. And I was like, oh my gosh. I was like, okay. But so one, one thing I learned as a marketer is that you never want to have a false negative. What do you mean? What, like when you do an experiment, right? So if, if you don't do it right and you get a negative answer, that doesn't mean that that technique or that channel or that message isn't good. It just means you didn't do it right. Yeah. You know, so I have this thing. It's like, if you're going to go for it, freaking go yeah. for it. And then if you get a negative out of it, then you know, it's a negative. There's nothing else you could have done. And so we were like, we're going to go for it. We are going to throw a punch at the venture capital institution. And we are going to capture the attention of retail investors and inform them that they can't do this. And now they can and come be our friend, join this mission, join this journey. And it worked. I mean, it was, uh, it blew my mind how we were able to go out and, um, and really just like get people to resonate with us and people who never gave a crap about anything with venture capital or startups love what we are doing. Okay. Wait, okay. There's tactically, I have questions. So the agency, great. I've seen that model before. We've seen Dollar Shave Club, as you mentioned, we've seen people probably have seen already on Instagram or Facebook, or whatever, these videos are like, okay, I get the concept. I, Basically, Dollar Shave kind of started it in many ways. Squatty Pie, as you mentioned. But you get, we work at this agency, you commit to this. It's like massive. This is huge. <laughs> like, we're going for it. But to have a video is one thing. You have to distribute it somehow. You have to put money behind it somehow. You have to like put it out there somehow. Like, how did the distribution side of even having this like solid asset that you now know you can use again and again and again, which is great. But having this asset and then getting it in people's hands, letting them see it, et cetera, is different. So take me through distribution. How do you think about that? Well, I mean, we started with the usual suspects, you know, we were heavy on Facebook, yep. and Instagram, and this is where like, I also learned a lesson the hard way a few different times. It's funny how you have to learn a lesson, <laughs> the same lesson a few times before different cases. Sticks. That's why Jesse, but just I, diff different cases, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. We'll, we'll go with that. Uh, but I, I failed on Facebook advertising in a few different contexts. And I was like, look, if you're going to advertise on Facebook and Instagram, you have to work with people that know what they're doing and know the nuance and know how to test and, and figure it out. Yeah. Because if you just wander into it, you're not going to get very good results. Um, and so we, we were working with uh, a group that was just super smart and they got us, they got our feet wet. Right. And they're, they're the ones that really got the thing moving. Um, and we actually had some real trouble when we first hit the market because we launched everything. We, we were all prepared. I mean, I remember me and my co-founder, Matthew, who's over all our marketing stuff. We were at the office until like one in the morning for like six days straight preparing for this big launch. And there were only a few of us, you know, like no one to do all the work. And so we we're just like grinding through and trying to create all these automations and to capture everybody and, and get everything ready, you know. And um, we we had the ad running for about 48 hours and Facebook pulled it down. Um, and we were like, what, what, what's wrong? Like, what do we do? And they, they like wouldn't give us an answer. And we were going back and forth for like two weeks. And we finally found out that, um, that they saw us as a financial offering, even though we weren't pushing anyone to actually take a financial decision because it was just a wait list. They still put us in this finance category. We had to go through this huge review process with them and make sure that we were legit and not a scam and all this stuff. And then we came out the other end. And what was really irritating, honestly, is like we were aiming for like two or three bucks for an email acquisition. Yeah. And that's what we were getting when we launched. But when they relaunched us, our acquisition costs jumped to eight to $12 Jeez. for no reason <laughs> at all. And we were like, you've got to be yeah. kidding us. Like you came and put us in this financial app category and now you're trying to charge us Way what, beyond. you know, you know, finance app acquisition costs ought to be. It was actually super dirty, but we got into it and we're like, okay, we accept our fate. Let's just run with it. And it, it was great. So, I mean, that was just like steady running for like six months. And we were getting great acquisitions through that. Um, but then we actually, we, we took a, we ended up with a second close, which was unexpected for us. Yeah. And so we had a little bit of extra money and I was like, I'm not giving up extra dilution just to have extra money sitting in the bank. I'm like, we're going to put yeah. this to work like right now. And so we had some opportunities to go to some uh, financial meme accounts like nice. on Instagram nice. and all, all these like Wall Street related um, 
you know, accounts like uh, Wall Street Bets say, and Wall Street Bets, yeah. um, Trust Trust Fund Terry and Liquidity and like all these guys. And, and we started going through these financial meme accounts and they're creating memes and promoting sweater within them. And it had nothing to do with this big asset we created. But man, that landed just like so strong. And um, we had people from all over the world contacting us like, oh my gosh, like we see you guys on, on liquidity <laughs> or whatever. And, um, and it gave us this, this multi-channel uh, legitimacy for people because people that, that were being targeted on Facebook and Instagram had strong correlation with the same people that were making observations and like just following these financial meme accounts in general. And so they're getting this, this cross pollination between all these financial meme accounts and then getting hit with our ads later with these video ads, which was just a super strong combo. Like, I don't think that we would have gotten anywhere close to 70 with the budget that we had if we had only pushed it all through Facebook and Instagram, the, the multi-channel and the, uh, the lended trust approach by going through a third party that was promoting yeah. us made all the difference in the world. Yeah. It's a huge part of it in terms of putting it all together for your strategy. And obviously it's worked out to get that many people on board as well. And one thing with that I'm curious about, so you have this waiting list just high level. Cause we haven't really discussed it. It's like the model behind it. People who are familiar with a venture fund, the two and 20 management fee model, you know, that what is the model for sweater? Uh, what does it look like? Yeah, it's pretty straightforward. I mean, um, you know, there's, there are some fairly big differences between a traditional VC fund and the way that we operate. So it's, I think instructive to understand how a traditional VC fund works first. So uh, in that context, the industry standard is called a two and 20, like you mentioned, right? So it's a 2% management fee, 20% carried interest. And what that means is, um, you know, take a $100 million venture fund as an example. So on a $100 million venture fund, that 2% management fee is 2% of 100 million, usually for the first five years. And that capital is used by the investment team to actually go out and source deals, vet companies, um, you know, conduct due diligence, take care of companies, all that stuff, cover all the overhead to make the investments possible. The carried interest actually comes at the very end of the process. So most funds uh, these days last 12 to 15 years. So if those fund managers took that $100 million and over the course of 12 years turned it into $300 million, then that means that there was a gain of $200 million for the fund. And the fund managers would take 20% of that gain or $40 million into their own pockets for growing the fund. So that's the two ways that the fund managers make money out of it. So Sweater is different because we fall under a category called a registered investment company, which is kind of like a cousin to a mutual fund. So like when you put money into a mutual fund, you're buying in at a net asset value, you're buying shares in that fund, they're pooling all that money, and then they take it and go out and put it in public stocks and equities, you know, whatever the thesis is for that yeah. particular mutual fund. And so we're kind of the same way, except instead of us investing in public entities, we're investing in private entities one at a time, just like a venture fund would do. So our fee structure is a 2% management fee, uh, and there's no carried interest, excuse me, two and a half percent management fee, no carried interest. And the two and a half percent management fee uh, is in perpetuity. So it goes on forever because our fund structure is evergreen, just like a mutual fund. So we can raise money constantly and in perpetuity. And then we're also constantly deploying capital at the same time and taking cash and turning it into equity inside ownership structures inside companies. Um, so that two and a half percent management fee lasts for the entire life of the fund. And as the fund value grows, just like your mutual fund, that two and a half percent is applied to the growing value of the fund and the growing value of any given person's position. So from our perspective, it's kind of like taking a two and 20 on a fund that returns 2x cash on cash over 12 or 14 years is basically the same thing that we're getting. We're just taking it in a different way. Yeah. Um, but our motivation is still aligned to grow the value of the investment because we're paid more as the value of the fund gets bigger, which is attached to the quality of the investments we make. With Sweater as well, you have a different model with how you actually end up having people to get out of the fund slash have the returns. Not the same as a venture fund or the two and 20 model where you're, uh, you're locked in for a very long time as you kind of went through right before this. But take me through that model with Sweater in terms of how people can actually get their money out. Uh, venture firm, you're locked up for a long time. Sweater has a different model. I'm curious about that though, Jesse. Yeah, yeah. So in, in a traditional venture firm, uh, an investor in that fund is going to be locked up for 12 to 15 years. So the only way that money comes out is when there's an exit event or a liquidity event in one of the underlying portfolio companies, which takes a long time. I mean, if you're lucky, you might get an early hit after like three to five years, but most of the companies in the portfolio are going to mature in a seven to 12 year time frame after you put the money in. And then that money can come back to you based on your position in the fund. 
it takes forever. And that's really the only way to get your money out. Um, but in sweater, it's a different structure. Um, so we're required as part of our regulatory uh, framework to actually strike a price on the portfolio every single day. We're striking the NAV. NAV stands, it's, it's short, NAV for net asset value. So we're striking that every day. So we're looking at all of our assets and saying, does any of this change? That includes cash positions, that includes all the equity positions and all the companies. And we're constantly updating that. Um, and we have these uh, redemption windows that are built in every six months. So this is super unique. It doesn't exist anywhere else in venture. And effectively what it does is it allows us to buy back uh, a portion of shares in any given window from members of the fund. So if anyone wants to sell a portion or even all of their position, they have an opportunity to do so every six months. There is a protection in place though for the fund and for all the remaining investors in the fund. So that there's not a run on the bank. And that is that we only have to redeem up to 5% of the value of the fund in any given window. So uh, that doesn't prevent anyone from requesting their whole position out. Uh, so basically like, um, you know, if I had $10,000 in the fund and I, you know, my grandmother passes away and I've got to pay for funeral and other expenses and I need to get to that, I can go in and request my entire position out. And what Sweater does is they look at my request and aggregates it with everyone else's requests. And if it's less than 5% of the value of the fund, everyone gets whatever they requested. If it's above that, then we get pro rata of whatever requested, which is basically like your percentage you know, uh, of the total. So if the total aggregate requests was 10% of the value of the fund, then I would get half of whatever I requested. And then I could come back in the next window, which you know, again, is like unheard of in the venture space. This does not exist. Yeah. Um, and it's one of the reasons the SEC was willing to work with us on this. With this too, there's so many things to dive into uh, with your model. One of the things I'm curious about too, you decided to make an app for this. Was it always in the cards to have an app? Because it didn't necessarily have to be that way. It's definitely convenient, but there's complexity with an app. Just take me through that being the decision of how you're going to kind of launch this, I guess, or have this in the hands of consumers. I'm curious. Oh yeah. No, this was uh, from day one, day zero. This was going to be a mobile app. We wanted it to be in people's hands. Um, you know, we consider ourselves a technology company first that just happens to be operating an underlying venture fund. That's how we see ourselves. Um, and so for us, it was always about the technology because, I mean, yeah. you think about, I mean, uh, just think about scale for a second. You know, I mean, today when we've got, you know, four or 5,000 members, you know, like you could manually manage that, like there's things you can do. But when we've got a quarter million or 2 million members, I mean, that that's a lot to manage. And inside the um, the paperwork requirements and, and the fund flow structures and recurring investments and all this other stuff, it's just very difficult to manage without technology. And so we could have done web-based, but we decided we wanted to do mobile first and mo mobile only because we wanted this to be able to live in people's hands and to give them a much deeper, richer experience than just an investment. We want to bring them into the entire venture ecosystem experience and let them see what's going on and experience it. So we equate it to having courtside seats to the game, right? We want to bring you into the stadium, give you courtside seats. You don't get to shoot the ball and you don't get to coach the team, but we'll give you a tour of the locker room. Maybe a player will fall out of bounds and get some sweat on you, right? You can buy some swag. You can have a good time, right? You get to feel the energy of the game, but you don't get to play in the game, right? That's our job. That's why you're giving sweater the money and we're organizing everything. So um, you know, there's lots of stories to be told. There's lots of education to provide. And all of that is facilitated through the app. And we have some really big plans for further technology integration and features and experiences that we're going to be providing over the next couple of years that we believe can change the way that venture fundamentally operates and works. Um, and so it's like, as an example, right, we basically, the whole ecosystem is super I'm, I'm going to go down a rabbit hole. Sorry. We're here so, for it. <laughs> <laughs> so, so the whole industry is just, it's, it's super inefficient, right? You have investors over here, you have founders over here and somewhere out here in the ether, you have all of the founders or the startups, potential customers, right? And they're not in the same place. It's very disparate. And, you know, um, VCs will often say we have value add, we can help you founders to you know be able to get somewhere faster. But the reality is that's very limited, right? a VC with a few employees or a few general partners just can't get that far, right? In, in terms of helping you. But when you examine Sweater, I mean, our very investors are the people that are going to be buying your product, Mr. Startup, Mr. Founder, Mr. And Mrs. Founder, right? Like we, what if, uh, you know, kind of the traditional model is like the VC gives you a war chest of resources and says, okay, here's your war chest. Now go hunker down and go attack the world, right? 
and, and try to get, get someone's attention and try to build your startup. And what we're effectively saying is, well, here's a war chest, but what if we bring the world to you instead of you going out to have to find the world? And that's what we're trying to do with the technology is bring our, our entire member base together and identifying who they are, what they do for a living, what their interests are, the things that pain them and understand them at an intimate level so that when we have a startup that's relevant to them, they can actually take part in helping that startup find success. And being and the only way to really facilitate that is at scale is, is via technology. And so that's why we're a technology company first. There's just amazing things we're going to be able to do. Yeah, that part of it is something we thought about a lot with the angel community. So the reason why we bought Five Eyes Angels, open up access to everyone in a different way, uh, individual investors. But to your point of like, how do you operationalize somewhat the investors you have? Then if you have a pool of lots of investors, obviously they can all have value. Once you hit scale, like we were doing, it was a lot different in terms of the value because you have so many different people, um, which I find really fascinating. And one of the things with, with that, that we haven't like mentioned anything about yet is like what companies are you actually looking for? How much are you looking to deploy? How how frequently? What stages? I mean, there's all those those logistics. Like we have like a few minutes left that we have to get to because I'm like also curious about that. But you built this up to this point. But take me through more of the investment side of it and like what you're looking for, stages, all of that sort of thing. Oh yeah. I mean, I love this part of the business. This is the whole reason that I, I started moving my career in this direction in the first place. Capital deployment and working with founders is like my lifeblood. This is where it's at. So, and, and our, our, one of our mantras is that we are nothing but the value of our investments, right? We are only as good as the investments that we make. Uh, and so finding great founders is super important. Um, so our thesis overall, um, there's two major bars we have to get through, and then we start examining the company itself. So first one is they have to be venture qualified, which for those that aren't as you know uh, familiar with this space, venture qualified is basically it has to have the DNA to get really big, right? Um, we're not going to invest in a brewery. We're not going to invest in a single product company that you see on Kickstarter or on Shark Tank, right? We have to invest in companies that have the ability to really flourish and become substantial. Um, and there's a lot of different, like it's different for every industry. I mean, there's a lot of ways you can measure that, but we look at it and say, is it venture qualified? If it passes that test, the next level is really our thesis for this first fund, uh, which we call consumer touching. Uh, so consumer touching in our definition is, you know, any product or service or experience that an everyday person could encounter in their everyday life, you know, at home or at work. So that could be direct consumer products. Um, I mean, that could be apps on your phone, but that could also be software like Slack or zoom back when they were private right like anything that you have a meaningful brand interaction as a consumer matches that thesis um, and then for us like the portfolio building process is also different because the fund is evergreen so a typical fund of 100 million dollars or 10 million dollars or a billion dollars is typically looking to make 30 to 50 investments maybe even fewer than that to deploy all that capital but sweater in a way, the cashmere fund can live forever. And so um, we're operating off of um, a thesis called large portfolio theory, which is basically we're aiming to make hundreds of investments, not dozens of investments. Um, and so because of that, we have a much broader aperture of the stage uh, and the industry of companies that we can invest in. So we'll invest between pre-seed and series B at check sizes from a quarter million up to 10 to 15 million on the upper end as the fund gets bigger. Um, and you know, it, it all matches. It's like real time capital deployment as well. Right. So like we raised $10 million last month. That means this month and next month, we need to deploy $10 million, right? Like we're not going to sit on that cash for a long time. So it creates different operating cycles, uh, and what have you. But to date we've, we've made, uh, 11 investments in the last seven or eight weeks. Um, and we've announced five of them. So the other <laughs> six will be announced pretty soon, but we're, we're, we're coming out of the out of the gates pretty hot. Geez, like one or two investments a week. That's uh, <clears throat> definitely a lot, uh, which is which is impressive. I'm I'm curious too. With that, just as one of, one of the last questions here, the team behind it. Then, like operationally, how big are you looking at putting the team in place around like building the technology versus finding sourcing investments? You said you have scouts, but then like evaluating investments, the investment team side of things. Just like what does that team look like then from that uh, that perspective? Yeah, so we're at, I think we're pushing 30 employees now. Um, so we've got an engineering team of about eight or nine. Um, we have a deal team of about eight or nine. And then we have a marketing team that covers the, the rest of the expanse there. Um, and they're all independent of each other. They have very different roles. I mean, and this, this is where like Sweater as an entity is just very different than your typical startup because it's much more than like develop a product, sell the product, right? It's like 
we have multiple products in a yeah. way, right. That we have to build and operate and they all have to be independent and, and live within themselves. You know, I mean, like even just take just fund operations as its own category. It's just this massive, very detail oriented thing with board yeah. meetings and compliance and, um, you know, fund forecasting. And like, I mean, there's just like so much to it that it has to have its own roles built around it, you know? Um, but yeah, so the people specifically on the deal team have been around the block a few times. You know, my co-founder, Chad Bukowski, is our chief investment officer. He was at City for 14 group, excuse me, for 14 years in their investment management division um, and doing investment banking. Um, he built his own company um, prior to Sweater that's raised tens of millions of dollars. And um, our principal investor, she was at Chicago Ventures and Selwyn Ventures and um, we've had uh, folks come from a variety of different places within the venture ecosystem. And so we've got a solid team um, and it's really fun to be able to build out a new way of thinking about how to process deal flow and find great opportunities. And it's been extra inspiring for me to see that founders are seeing the additional value that Sweater brings to them. And about half the deals that we've been in so far have been founders and investors coming to us saying, we want you on the cap table and we are going to move other people out of the way so that you can have a slice of this. And it's, it's been awesome so far. We're, we're really grateful for the alignment that we have in the market. Yeah, no, that's awesome. I have one, not one, maybe like two questions left. Uh, one is just sweater. Why the name sweater ventures? Uh, oh, everyone has a story for something for the name. I'm just curious. Oh yeah, for sure. So sweater, we knew we were going to be a direct consumer company. And so we wanted something that everyone could relate to. And, you know, sweaters, um, you know, everybody owns a sweater. <laughs> doesn't matter if you're rich or poor, old or young, male or female, where you live in the world. It's probably one of the most relatable items. And it's completely unclaimed by anyone, um, you know, besides just being a generic category for clothing. Um, and so there was an opportunity there, but it, there's also something inherently interesting about it. I mean, it's, <laughs> it's warm and it's approachable and, you know, it, it gives just, the, there's something about it that people have just fallen in love with. And at first I kind of shied away from being too obvious, Yeah. you know, but like, as soon as we start hitting the market, people are like, Hey, when can I get my sweater sweater? I really want one, you know? And I'm like, really? Like, that seems so obvious, but people are just like pounding down our doors. We're actually launching an entire merch strategy right now <laughs> with like premium, like really premium product for people. Um, and so that, that's kind of where it stemmed from and, and people love it. You know, one day you're just going to be a direct to consumer sweater company and like, well, how'd this start? You know, <laughs> we started investing in companies and they were like, let's just, the sweaters, you know, just took off. So we had to keep going. I will say I'm slightly disappointed that you're not wearing a sweater for people watching on YouTube. Oh. I kind of expected it, Jesse. So I'm a little disappointed, but I guess I'll let that slide. Um, I'm so sorry. I, I totally, totally <laughs> usually wear a sweater, but it is July just for the record. I know, I know for context when this will be released. Yeah, this is July recording. So I guess I'll give you a little bit of slack on that. Uh, last question, just where can people find more about Sweater and connect with you as well? If they like, if they like to. Oh, for sure. Well, I mean, first download the app. The app's free. You don't have to make an investment to get in and actually see all the content. We have tons of educational content, not just around how Sweater itself works, but around venture in general um, and soon to be a whole lot more content that's in there. We actually have a whole uh, media production team inside Sweater that just creates content all the time. Um, so you can download the app and get in there. Um, there's also sweaterventures.com as, uh, you know, we've got a lot of information on the website, you find the prospectus there, you can get into all that kind of stuff. And then I love it when people come and follow me on LinkedIn. I'm i uh, I'm kind of a LinkedIn junkie, which is maybe a weird place I, to be these days, I've but, seen that. <laughs> but dude, I love it. Why, why LinkedIn for you as your main platform? Also, what's your strategy with that? Cause I, I I've seen that you post a ton it looks great. Oh uh, yeah. You know what? I, I was just never really attracted to Twitter. I gave Twitter like a, a pretty good push back in like 2016, 2017, and just wasn't getting fulfillment out of it. Mm. Um, and in about that same time frame, I started pushing around and, and messing around on LinkedIn and they had started updating their algorithms and trying to make it more social instead of just job related. Content, yeah. And I kind of got in on the, the front end of that and started figuring out my voice there. And I just came to love the content format. I, I feel like I can express myself well. It gives me more room to do it. Um, I feel like my audience is really authentic and they're real people, you know, you're not going to get trolled a lot in, in, in general, just because people are also a reflection of their professional life. Right. Yeah, so yeah. they don't want to be jerks as much sure. on LinkedIn. I just feel like it, it fosters a really good environment. I love it there. No, I appreciate sharing that. And, uh, because you shared so much about everything, I'll, I'll cut you some slack on the sweater itself, but Jesse, thank you so much for the time today. I really appreciate it. Hey, it's all, it's my pleasure, man. Thanks for having me on.